trees in landscape painting considerations of balance a chapter from the artistic anatomy of trees their structure and treatment in painting by rex vicat cole nineteen fifteen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter three balance of dark spaces with light and of large masses with small weight of masses and delicacy trees seen near and far off balance of dark spaces with light if it is difficult to represent trees it is much more difficult to place them in the right position on the canvas the difficulty is due to the necessity of balancing all the parts so as to produce an agreeable whole it is the appreciation of balance in a good picture that distinguishes it from a bad in its complete meaning balance embraces color line light and shade the balance of warm and cold colors of straight and curved lines of light and dark and gray spaces the greater part of an artist's time and thought is occupied with these problems the balance of light and dark spaces only is here touched on in its relation to the painting of trees the first difficulty before a student is to see nature as spaces of light and dark not as a number of separate objects independent of their surroundings a tree might be this shape figure fourteen but if there is a shadow under it it becomes for the purpose of a picture this shape figure fifteen and we see that the shadow is as important as the tree in forming this dark space a couple of trees might be distinct in lighting or they might from similarity of tone be used as one form it is of the utmost importance to realize this so i will press the point further here are two trees a piece of ground and a figure but under a uniform lighting they become one form and it is the space of gray between them that attracts attention take another example the trees are by the water side but the wind destroys their reflection the water is still and the space of dark is twice as long as before again there are three trees but they make different spaces nature provides the spaces of light and dark by cloud shadows by reflection by pale and dark colored objects by rain clouds and clear skies the labor of man adds to our choice crops of different hues pale cornfields dark herbage and tilled ground the spaces are there if we seek them but are very rarely arranged ready for use or are seen for a moment only under a passing effect of light they have to be balanced to become acceptable if they happen to be more or less arranged they must be transferred to the canvas on an appropriate scale or they lose their vitality a balance in exactly equal proportions between dark and light masses is too formal to be pleasing but a total want of balance is even more disquieting a fact that beginners should note as they too often err in placing their principal objects in out-of-the-way corners of their canvas having heard they should not be quite in the center there is a quaintness and unaffectedness in the formality of nearly equally spaced light and dark that should be recognized the charm of hobena's avenue see plate thirteen page thirty five owes something to this as well as to the receding straight lines the well-worn plan of a diagonal division of dark and light 
with a small strong dark in the light and small lights in the dark seems as fresh and pleasing as ever and we turn to it in corot's souvenir de mort fontaine as if it were something new when the principal objects form a dark pattern against the background our efforts are mainly directed to disposing them well after that in placing the smaller forms such as detached pieces of foliage and elaborating the interest of their outline if the objects are strongly lit more attention must be paid to the individual parts the shapes of masses of foliage must be selected with a view to a good design the character of this being determined by the habit of growth of the tree it is a matter for compromise between appearance and art there will be truth as well as beauty in an intelligent rendering of these selected forms which a literal statement of appearances overlooking the main design cannot give the value of interesting spaces of dark and light is nowhere better seen than in those pictures where a number of tree trunks play an important part the interior of a pine wood under ordinary lighting is insufferably dreary the parallel lines of the trunks with but little variety of intervals are as wearisome as the bare hop poles of kent though the pines might make a background for a funeral procession lit by the setting sun the stems become spaced by light and shade some are caught by the golden light others sink into uniform grayness patches of foliage tell dark and sharp between so we get intervals of light dark and middle tones and our duty is to choose each tone not for its value independently but for its influence over other tones throughout the design it is not necessary that a picture should always be divided into large masses of light and dark a sparkling effect of considerable beauty is obtained by patches of alternating light and dark a theme which has been exploited with success by modern painters the pictorial possibilities of this spotted arrangement is no new discovery figure painters employed it long ago but its application to landscape seems an innovation to the credit chiefly of monet and his followers the fascination of sunlit ground splashed with a checkered shade from trees should convince even the stereotyped painter who follows the old routine that nature presents many different faces that could be utilized for the pleasure of those shut up in towns i can never see large stems cutting across a landscape without feeling again the grandeur and notion of space they convey but this impression is more often gained from the intervals between the trunks than from the trunks themselves the greatness of a colonnade seen in perspective is always felt and something of this architectural sense of dignity is seen in the stems it is a good plan when drawing to shape the largest forms first and this method applied to a row of trees ensures strict attention being given to the spaces between the trees draw the spaces first then redraw the trunks left between turner's liber studiorum should open the road to the study of balance in dark and light masses the drawing near blair athol is perhaps the finest balance of large and small objects there is an arrangement amateurs are fond of it consists of some trees equal in size surrounded by large tracts of country a most difficult plan in which to interest anyone the unvaried and small scale of the trees makes them unimportant and gives them that little far-off look of figures on a stage 
when seen from the gallery. The spectator loses the perspective that decides the size of objects. That this is a serious loss will be understood if a distant tree is looked at through a telescope and compared with one seen near at hand. Both may be drawn the same size, but there is no foreshortening in the one seen through the telescope. W. L. Wiley, in his artistic book on perspective, gives examples of boats seen near and far off, and the study of this work will suggest many applications of the laws of nature to the drawing of trees. But this type of picture has other faults. These small trees, if not arranged, suggest a strip of landscape chosen at random and copied indifferently well. If they are arranged from the large spaces that surround them, they seem to be the only trees in the country. This would not be the case if they were cut off by the edges of the picture. The value of variety in the size of objects cannot be overstated, and the illusion that makes a twig in the foreground look as large as a whole tree in the distance should be utilized to the utmost, though the absurd distortion of the camera should be avoided. Again, if we refer to the Liber, we see how often Turner allowed his trees to be cut off. He liked to be nearly under them, and the trunks seemed to him immense, stretching up we do not know how far into the sky. Behind the trunks there is a speck for a tree, evidently miles away. On one side of the picture there is half a tree, on the other side just a spray. This is the sort of landscape you can walk into among the trees, instead of having that horrid space to get over before you reach the footlights. Every able painter knows the use of variety in the size of masses and uses it. One thinks of Britain Riviere's picture of the great banks of clouds and the tiny figure below with outstretched arms. A fine landscape in which mere dots for trees and a strip of ground support great skies. Turner, with much daring in one drawing, mill near the Grand Chartreuse, has run great stems through the height of the picture so that they are cut off both by the top and bottom margin. But see how they take us right up to the crags and rushing water. We get intimate with the scene immediately. With many objects differing in size, it would seem impossible to get a nice balance if it were not that a small, separate object is so effective that it balances a large object that is not isolated. See Corot's Macbeth and the Witches. Differences of surface often help a small object to hold its own against larger ones. For instance, a large mass of indistinct willows will be balanced by a small tuft of sharply defined rushes. There are times when the size of a thing is settled for us, but we wish to make it appear larger or smaller. Let us suppose that you have a tree trunk that does not give the impression of great girth as you wish it to do. Add the line of a sapling beside it, and it takes its full size directly. If a form seems too large, devise some way of dividing it into sections by lines if you cannot lessen it by the easier method of splitting it up into different tones of light and dark. The object of dividing a space to reduce its length will be seen by comparing a bare larch stem and an ash that has boughs, both having the same heights. Looking at the larch, you run your eye up and down and arrive at no conclusion as to its height. It merely seems terribly tall. Run your eye along the ash, and it pauses at the first branch, then at the next, and you can guess the length of each section. 
the mystery of its unknown height is gone it is a thing you can measure and therefore think less of weight of masses and delicacy the principal consideration if we leave out color in composing a picture is without doubt the balance of large forms with small and the balance of dark forms with gray and white but we must not overlook the importance of comparing decided masses with indefinite ones and in landscape this requires particular attention we hear a picture summed up by those who do not paint as so nice and soft horribly hard as if it were teddy bears or other absurdities that were talked of generally a picture should have both qualities the one of them may predominate the charm and use of indefinite forms compared with solid masses is well seen in the bulk of tree foliage bordering the sky apertures these however must be taken in detail presently Another example is when a tree of massed foliage and one thinly clad stand the one in front of the other. It is a case where the outline of the massed one may either be used to contrast sharply with the delicate forms of the other, or the delicate forms may be a means of lessening the abruptness of the massed form by blurring it, as it were, into the sky. A great space of indefinite form may be balanced by a small, distinct one. This we notice when a dab chick swims in front of a great bed of withies. Some would say this happens because the dab chick is alive and lively, therefore more interesting than the withies. But a lump of wood really answers the purpose equally well. Trees seen near and far off. A distant tree, rendered flat in tone by the atmosphere, is recognized by the pattern it makes against the sky or the background. The main shape, unconfused by any detail of foliage, stands out clearly as an oblong, a semicircle, a cone, or whatever form of outline may distinguish its species. Marked differences in the construction of the outline become apparent. The elm with a border of straight lines can be distinguished at a great distance from a beach with undecided edges of loose sprays. A Lombardy poplar acts as a sentinel among the squat forms of the oaks and is as valuable in the picture as a church spire would be. There is no edge to the larch wood, just a haze. Against it, the upright lines of the trunks show as faint streaks of gray here and there. We cannot distinguish each tree, nor do we wish to, but the inexhaustible variety caused by the density or thinness of the foliage, the sharpness or want of definition in the outline, and the varied shapes of the silhouettes should be looked for and made interesting. It is not enough to represent them by a number of monotonous dots which serve no purpose in the picture. Look out for groups of trees on the skyline. They are sometimes architectural in design and as useful as a feudal castle would be. You can find straight lines or undulating ones in the woods that line the hill just whichever you want with here and there spots of light. Perhaps the sky rim of the wood is fuzzy, and the earth line tells with a sharp edge in the gaps between the trunks. Or it may be that some young trees, just like the toy ones that are sold with Noah's Ark, stand in a row on the hilltop, or line some division between the fields. They serve as a reaction from forms that are too pompous, and they show the scale of the country. From my window, I see tops of trees beyond the hill line, suggesting the unseen land beyond. Plantations stretch from this side of the hill to the other, disappearing in graduated steps behind it. 
other woods run down the gullies or pass over the high ground into the hollows fixing all the contours and undulations of the hill all these facts give variety and help in the portraiture of a particular district they give the artist the chance of securing accents of light and dark though these are more often obtained by passing clouds that throw an indigo shadow over parts in strong contrast to the glow of a sunlit field or the blue haze of the distance in the middle distance the local color of the trees begins to show through the atmosphere the lighter green of an ash or lime is distinguished from that of the darker sycamore elm or oak and the pine woods make a startling patch of dark the silver tones of the willows and poplars flicker in the sunlight or gleam white against the sky as a breeze passes and the little white beam or the wayfaring tree becomes as important as half the woodlands in the very distant trees a point of difference is seen only in the outline of the foliage against the background with these closer to hand it can be seen in the middle of the tree as well we cannot mistake the thin layers and detached spiked sprays of the beech the heavier layers and drooping curves of the lime the tufted foliage of the oak with its star-shaped projections the massed sharp-edged foliage of the sycamore and plain the poplar made up of dotted leaves or the blurred edges of the willows the shadows between the foliage may alone betray the species in some they are sharp and dark in others faint and confused massed or detached forming lines consistently in one direction or another whether the shadow is easy to find as in an elm or impossible to follow as in a poplar is an important point in depicting the character of the tree and perhaps still more important in an artist's search for variety the direction of the chief branches can be followed and in places the junction of branch with bough explains its method of growth at this distance the elbows and twists of an oak may not be unlike those of a walnut and yet a subtle difference maintained throughout prevents our confusing one with the other the same habit of observation enables us to distinguish them as it helps us to appreciate the suave lines of willow branches which lack something of the spring in the lissom lines of a birch the trees close at hand are unmistakable it is no longer a matter of giving a main character but one for consideration of individual traits of recognizing how the tree in all its parts conforms to the ways of its fellows in the species and in what way it asserts its independence. We note how much its appearance is due to some stronger influence, perhaps of a prevailing wind, and the picturesque qualities that storms or position have endowed it with. The suitability with the locality or the sentiment of the subject might be considered. Attention becomes focused also on smaller matters, such as the technical treatment of twigs and leaves against the sky or the amount of definition in the foliage a single leaf may look as large as a distant tree a bunch of leaves may balance a hillside the treatment of near trees is not one to dictate upon they can be painted for themselves with the delight to be found in every detail insisted upon and the country used as a background for displaying them or they may be thought to be out of focus as it were if the eye is on more interesting objects behind them and can be treated just as a mass of tone and color if the painter's belief is a sincere one and humble one he may choose his way 
his own views should be respected and he stands or falls by the way he presents his views end of trees in landscape painting considerations of balance a chapter from the artistic anatomy of trees their structure and treatment in painting by rex vicat cole 1915 read for librivox by sue anderson